Welcome to another unit in this course on economics. This time I'm going to talk about the neoclassical growth model, which is also referred to as the solo or the solo swan growth model. The basic idea here is to have a model which explains economic growth in dependence of the capital stock. So the capital stock here is the main point of interest and the developments of the capital stock. So before we really start with our model, let's have some basic assumptions underlying our model, especially the model we are going to start with here. The first assumption is we have an equilibrium in the labor market. So there is no unemployment. Everyone is working. We have a single closed economy. The importance here lies on the closed part. So we do not have any economic ties to other countries. So no exports, imports, direct investments, especially no direct investments. So the capital stock is determined purely via domestic investments. We have a constant population. So population does not change. It always remains the same. And our production happens according to a Cobb Douglas production function, which would look in the easiest version like this. We could later on also add technological knowledge here as a factor A, but at the moment in the beginning, in the earliest version of this model, let's assume it's simply capital stock and labor as input factors. Under these assumptions, we can take a look how the capital stock K or KT for period T develops over time. And here this equation states how the capital stock in period T plus one comes to be. So it's basically the capital stock from the previous period reduced by the depreciations depreciation here as a certain share of the capital stock of today. So it's always only a share of the today's capital stock. And it's increased by the investments taking place today. If we have this development, we can simply here factor out the KT and get this development. So we have one minus delta times the capital stock of today plus the investments. Then we consider an equilibrium in the goods market. The equilibrium in the goods market would mean we have the equality of savings and investments. So whatever the household save is transferred to the companies to invest. Mathematically speaking, this means that we can replace the IT here with an ST. Or if we not use S, we can make this a bit more sophisticated by using the savings function, which in the context of this model simply is S as the savings rate times income times GDP. So we could replace this with S and then replace S with the savings function, giving us the same part as above here, but now with plus S times Y. So far, so good. Now we know something else as well. We also know that our production function is following a Cobb Douglas design. And the production function we can use to replace the Y at this point, the GDP at this point. So we use this production function at this point, which yields this part. This already has a big advantage because at this point we have an equation only with the capital stock as variable because we know that was one of our assumptions that 
the stock of labor is constant. And aside from the stock of labor, we only have the depreciation rate, which is considered constant, the savings rate, which is considered constant, and the capital intensity, which is also considered to be constant. So the only variable here is the capital stock. Okay, how can we get the solution of this equation for the capital stock in period T? For this, we have two possibilities. Either we can assume this to be some kind of differential or difference equation and solve this, or we can use a small trick, especially if we slightly rework this. So if we again write this part as kt minus delta k and bring the kt to the left side. So we subtract on both sides a kt, leaving us here only with minus delta kt. Why are we going to do this? Because on the left side, now we have the change in the capital stock, which we can simply write as delta kt. Now, well, either we solve this equation or if we're interested in the long-term solution, we can assume that in the long term, we will get something called a steady state. A situation where the capital stock no longer changes. So where the capital stock has converged to a specific long-term equilibrium level. Well, if the capital stock no longer changes in the steady state situation, this would mean that our change of the capital stock, so the value here on the left side of the equation, will become zero in the steady state. This is basically what I noted here in this sentence. The capital stock in the steady state, we denote as k pound or k hashtag, no longer changes and thus the change in the steady state is zero. Meaning we can rewrite our equation in the following form. And now this has a big advantage because now in this equation, we only have a single variable, which is the k pound. So what we can do is first off, we bring this to the other side, and then solve this for k pound, giving us our steady state capital stock. So we're solving this for k, having this intermediate step and then getting this solution for our capital stock in the steady state. And we see this capital stock in the steady state depends on the amount of available laborers positively, positively as well for a savings rate and negatively on the depreciation rate. However, we can also then switch from the absolute perspective of the capital stock to a per capita perspective. We do this by dividing by the amount of labor, so by L or L pound. And before we do this with this solution, let me just note something else. This is like a small side note. And that's that our GDP per capita, which is also GDP divided by labor, can, if we use a Cobb-Douglas production function, which we actually do here, be written as the capital stock per capita to the power of beta. We keep this in the back of our minds and then use it in this context. Because if we divide this equation by L, we get the capital stock per capita in the steady state in this version. Since we know that the GDP per capita is simply the capital stock per capita to the power of beta, we can use this equation to also describe our GDP 
in the steady state. So our long run GDP per capita solution, which is simply this result to the power of better. So we take this to the power of better and the other side as well, giving us here a GDP per capita in the long run of the savings rate divided by the depreciation rate to the power of better divided by one minus better. If now we are interested in the GDP, we can again multiply this with the amount of labor. However, this is the interesting thing because this tells us to which value in the long run the GDP will converge to. And that's the main insight we get in the context here of this neoclassical growth model, that now we can describe the long-term GDP per capita, and if we were to multiply this with the stock of labor, the long-term GDP in the context of this neoclassical growth model. The advantage of this formula is, well, if you recall from the beginning, we said, well, one assumption, we do not have any changes in the amount of available labor. So labor is constant. This value here is constant. If we assume population growth, so a change in the labor supply, the only change we will get in our solution not going to show this mathematically, but the only change we will have is that instead of dividing by delta, we're dividing by delta plus n, with n being the population growth. Also, if we assume technological knowledge, so if our production function is not k to the power of better times l to the power of 1 minus beta, but instead a times all of this, then we also will have simply an a in front of all of this. And if the stock of knowledge is growing by a rate of a, we simply have to put the a down here as well. So it would be delta plus n, population growth, plus a, the growth of the stock of knowledge. So you can see this model can easily be expanded and the solution still looks relatively simple, especially if compared with the original solution of this very easy, very simple model. Well, that's the mathematical solution to this neoclassical growth model. We can also get the same solution if we use a graphical approach. That's what I'm going to do here. So what I'm taking a look at here is on the one hand, my output, my GDP per capita, that's this function, and my savings per capita, which is simply the savings rate times the GDP per capita. Since the savings rate is somewhere between 0 and 1, we will get the same basic form of this function, but a little bit more downwards, because it's a little bit squeezed together. In addition to this, I'm also noting here the depreciations as simply the factor delta times, again I'm doing this per capita, the capital stock per capita. In this case, this will be a simple straight line. Well, what did we show in the model? Well, we showed basically that the capital stock in the steady state results from the situation where the increase in the capital stock so the investments, which here are equal to the savings, are identical with the depreciation. So in other words, this point E, 
where the savings curve intersects the depreciation curve gives us the steady state capital stock per capita. However, if we are not interested in the capital stock per capita, but in the GDP per capita, we simply extend this line upwards to our production function, our per capita production function, and note the corresponding GDP per capita, giving us here the corresponding GDP per capita value. So this is more or less the same way we worked through mathematically, only by trying to illustrate this graphically. Well, this then concludes this introductory session on the neoclassical growth model. We've seen the mathematical deduction of the model. We discussed the short graphical interpretation of this. And I also noted what happens if we expand this model slightly to include, for example, population growth or stock of knowledge, growth of the stock of knowledge. Well, that's then it for this session. So I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, say goodbye and see you next time.